If you're whipping or starving or hurting yourself, are you a religious fanatic or just kinky? Is pilgrimage an excuse to see a relic or simply tourism? What's the difference between fasting and dieting? Between mysticism and psychosis? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I am Professor Jerome Markenberg, and I have been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about medieval ideas of heaven, hell, purgatory, and limbo, faith and popular devotion, pilgrimage, relics, and saints, Lectio Divina, and mysticism. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. According to Roman Catholicism, man exists because God wants to share his life with us. So salvation is simply reunion with God. As our souls become integrated into God's self through the sanctifying grace of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. Roman Catholicism holds that, upon death, God decides, based on both one's faith and good works, where your soul shall go. The truly righteous will go immediately to heaven, though there's not too many of them. The truly wicked, who are again are kind of small in number, relatively speaking, will go straight to hell. But the vast majority will go to purgatory. Now, doctrinally, heaven is a place of eternal joy, one of glorious union with God. It's not quite a physical place, but all right. But medieval people found this hard to think essentially kind of in the abstract. So they thought of it as a place of nine concentric celestial spheres, each dedicated to one of the seven virtues which are faith, prudence, fortitude, justice, temperance, hope, and love, plus one for the angels and one for God. And this is seen in Dante, which reflects this. Similarly, in doctrine, hell was simply a place of eternal separation from God which alone was torture enough. But medieval people, again, as described by Dante, conceived of it as an underground city of nine levels, each with different penalties for the different kinds of sin, with Satan at its dark and fiery core. Here Satan rules demons and devils, aiming and scheming to gain the souls of men and women by tempting them to sin. On the outer edge of hell is, or perhaps we should say, was the limbo of the patriarchs. There are the souls of the Jewish prophets and patriarchs who lived before Christ's resurrection. Those who would normally go straight to heaven 
There they dwell until Christ is sent into hell, and where he frees them all in what's called the harrowing of hell. The idea is, until Jesus has been crucified and resurrected, nobody was allowed into heaven. There was also the limbo of the infants. In, since Vatican II in the 1960s, this no longer is recognized, but medieval people certainly did. The limbo of the infants was on the outermost rim of hell. A fun place, kind of like Chuck E. Cheese for infants. Here, unbaptized infants who were not yet freed of original sin, which meant you could not enter heaven till they had first been baptized, but also since their infants could clearly not have committed sin, exist in maximum happiness. From the 12th century, the Catholic Church held that purgatory was an actual place split into the purgatory of punishment to purify souls of their sins and cleansing fire that they may eventually enter heaven. And the purgatory of peace for virtuous non-Christians who died ignorant of Christ, probably mostly because the gospel of Jesus had never been preached to them. And yet, Otherwise, if it had been, they would have gone straight to heaven. So anyway, here they remain peacefully in the green fields and cool waters, awaiting the last judgment. Souls in purgatory can, however, have their suffering shortened by the prayers of the faithful and offered mass. At least one will take a few years off. An intercession from a saint, viewing and praying before a relic, going on a pilgrimage, or the purchase of an indulgence. But in the popular mind, again, as seen in Dante, Purgatory was a giant mountain in the southern hemisphere, essentially on the other side of the world, which also indicates they well knew the earth was round and not flat, they just had no idea that the Americas were around. Anyway, this was a giant mountain, as seen here, with seven levels for each of the deadly sins. So that's pride, envy, wrath, sloth, avarice, gluttony, and lust, plus a anti-purgatory for the excommunicated or the unabsolved who were unable or whatever happened or just unwilling to get rid of their, to be absolved, to be, to get rid of their excommunication. So they died before it could take place. Also for the lethargic and negligent rulers. Plus at the top is placed the garden of Eden where cleansed souls await the last judgment. Again, you see this description here. And then these are the various souls and various stages of purgatory. And the angels are coming to take them up to the Garden of Eden at the top when their punishment is done. Here's a woman, well, it's a soul whose punishment is done. Here's a woman whose punishment is done. These people are all being punished. Oh, look, that uh, seems to be a bishop, maybe a pope. And here's a guy with a tonsure, clearly a priest or a cleric of some sort. And this woman is being chewed on by an alligator and uh, I'm not sure what is that, uh, a bear, a badger, or something like that. At the end of time, Christ will come again and defeat the Antichrist, Satan, and the forces of darkness, which will trigger the last judgment and the resurrection of the dead. You will get your actual body back at the time of the last judgment. Don't worry. If you are missing a limb, you're blind, whatever. You will, your body will then become perfect. Otherwise, I prefer to have, say, Chris Hemsworth's body, please. This will be the end of the world and the end of time, and God shall live with his people forevermore.
popular devotion. Now, if you're Catholic or you grew up Catholic, all of this will seem very familiar to you. Not that much change. If you are not, you need to understand this, because without understanding it, you will not understand the Middle Ages or medieval civilization. So, back then and today, the church, Catholic Church, recognizes seven sacraments. Seven is a sacred number, in part because there were seven planets. The planets which were visible, plus the sun and the moon, which they counted as planets. I love this story. Now, the seven sacraments all channeled God's grace to all who received them. And this would be baptism. You see it here. Without baptism, you cannot get into heaven. You have confirmation now. If you have infant baptism, your godparents, uh, and the godparents will really march to see to it that you are brought up as a good Catholic and not just kind of a honorary thing. They would be living nearby you in the same community. But if you're an infant, they say, I do, that you're going to wish to be baptized and stuff and be a Catholic. But when you get to be an older age, the age where you can decide between good and evil, right and wrong, you follow through with confirmation. Think of it as a kind of second baptism. And, of course, confession, seen here where your sins can be confessed and absolved. You might have to go undergo certain types of penance. It might be a difficult penance, but you can have it absolved. There's also, of course, communion or the Eucharist. And the belief is the priest, and only a priest can do this, which would include member bishops and pope and everything. Uh, the body and, no, the uh, wine and bread is transubstantiated, literally becomes the body and bo body and blood of Jesus. And through communion, you can partake Jesus with you, into you. And of course, there's also matrimony, which wasn't always a sacrament, but certainly by 1100, 1200, certainly was. The Holy Union, so anything outside of matrimony, if you're having sex, anything else, you are going straight to hell, buddy. And, of course, last rites. Last rites are extreme unction. When you're on your deathbed, all of your sins, no matter how horrible, will be absolved from you. As long as you're truly sincere about it. So uh, the idea is, if you were a Catholic, if Hitler, say, example, was a Catholic, and at the end of his life was truly sorry for all the evil he had done and was given last rites by a priest, he would not, his sins would be forgiven. He would not go to hell. I'm not sure he would go. He probably would not go straight to heaven, but he certainly would spend time in purgatory. I said, yeah, you got to be truly powerful. There's also holy orders. And holy orders can only be done by a bishop or higher, and that is where a man is made into a priest, it's sort of like the mystical laying on of hands. Now, Mass is the center of worship and ritual, with the belief, again, as I said, that during the Eucharist, the communion, bread and wine are transubstantiated, that's the key term of art, into the actual body and blood of Jesus by an ordained priest. But only an ordained priest or bishop, you know, anyone who's born a priest, can do this. Anybody else, it just remains bread and wine. All Catholics, except those in a state of mortal sin, or those who are excommunicated or anathematized, and who have fasted for an hour, can receive communion to be one with Christ. And during the Middle Ages, uh, people did not take communion every day or every Mass. It was a bit rare, but at least twice a year, Christmas and Easter, sometimes more, but anything more than, say, 12 or 15 was somehow considered wrong. 
Also, when you receive the Eucharist, you only receive the bread, or as it later becomes, the wafer. As described here, the priest of the giant wafer of bread, you do not partake of any of the wine. That only changes after Vatican II in the 1970s. Besides going to Mass, and I said most medieval people went daily, they might complain about how the priest of the hierarchy, uh, friars, monks behaved, but they all believed fervently. They went daily. Catholics then and now express their devotion in a variety of other ways. One is to follow and pray at each of the stations of the cross. This begins in 5th century Bologna in Italy as a way to recreate a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, either for those who could not go there or they wanted to go, they just couldn't live there every time. And the present form, though, is only set by the Franciscans in the 14th century, who, by the way, also were the first to set up the nativity scene. Another way was daily prayer with a rosary. First used as an aid to prayer by monks in Egypt in the 3rd century, who may have gotten it from Buddhists. We know the Buddhists sent missionaries out to the West. We don't know exactly what happened to them, but that may be possibly be where they got it from. Anyway, but the practice grew popular as a way for the non-clergy, the laity, to pray like monks without actually being monks. There are simpler variations of the Paternoster, or the Our Father. It's Paternoster is Latin for Our Father, literally. And also the Ave Maria, or the Hail Mary, instead of the old Gregorian chant. Another way, very popular with women, especially from wealthy backgrounds, was to follow the canonical hours. If you don't know what those are, that is dealt with in my lecture on the life of the monk, by what's called the Lectio Divina, or divine reading. This is the practice followed by monks and other clergy. And you would read, meditate, pray, and contemplate, especially in a book of hours. For a book of hours, see my lecture on that. And for the idea of the Lectio Divina, again, my lecture on the regular clergy and the priest. Now, Lectio Divina aimed not for a more intellectual, analytical understanding of God, but for a deeper, more spiritual meaning and communion with God. That is, it's more about faith than reason. And it had to be done following four steps. Step one, slowly, gradually, and very attentively read a single passage from the Bible. Sometimes only one paragraph. But Christ is to be seen as key to its meaning. This is described very nicely in uh, this is described very nice in the different steps in this diagram. Secondly, meditate on the spiritual meaning of that passage by listening to that passage's inner meaning as delivered by the Holy Spirit and pondering it, considering it from all angles, spiritually, as a way to more fully understand God. Now, if you're doing it in terms of reason, you're doing it wrong. The whole Bible is supposed to be about understanding Christ and God's message about Christ. Third step, prayer. is a kind of dialogue with God. God speaks to you back. A guiding light to bring you into closer communion with God. Finally, step four, contemplation, an activity of faith. Maybe we'll call it emotional or maybe anti-rational, anti-reason, union with God. If you can put it into words and analyze it, it is not proper contemplation. It's more you somehow feel it in your gut. And even then, I'm not explaining it exactly because you can't really explain it. 
Now, yet another way to express devotion was to pray and adore a consecrated host for at least an hour. Now, remember, once the host is consecrated, that's the wafer, the host, the belief was and is that it is the actual body of Christ. So, like here, you are adoring. This is where the host would be in these things. And here again, uh, the priest carrying it through the streets. You are actually, in some ways, looking at Christ and praising him. Yet another way is for all of those over 14 to fast or abstain from food. And there are certain days on which you are required to fast. So you are required to fast on Ash Wednesday throughout the 40 days of Lent. So you're not just, say, giving up a piece of chocolate or something small. You are fasting throughout Lent, 40 days. You are fasting throughout the 40 days of Advent the period before Christmas. You also have to fast on the ember days. These are certain Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays during Advent, Lent, Pentecost, and September. This is a more extreme fast, especially during Advent and Lent. During the Rogation days, this is the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday before Ascension Thursday. You also have to fast on April 25th, August 14th, October 31st, December 7th, and Christmas Eve. Also, every single Friday, and of course, an hour before communion. Sounds like a lot, but it's not as much as, say, the Eastern Orthodox have to do. Abstinence is extra special fasting. So, abstinence requires abstaining entirely from food. While fasting meant but one meatless meal per day after sunset. In other words, you can't eat during the day at all from sunrise onwards. You can, after sunset, you could have one meal meatless. Along with no dairy, no olive oil or butter, depending on your region, no wine or beer, but from the 14th century, the church began to allow a light noon meal. However, the sick, travelers, students, these are students who are over 14, and those with physically difficult jobs were always exempt. Yet another way was to honor and venerate. Never worship, only God is to be worshiped but you can venerate, honor saints. Saints were given by God the power to hear the prayers of the faithful and grant their requests through miracles. And, of course, these are their shrines. In St. Albans in England, this is the shrine of St. Alban. This is the shrine of St. Catherine Labour. Uh, the face and hands were made out of wax. And supposedly, this is her skeletal body. And this is in York Minster, in the crypt, the shrine of St. William of York. Catholic doctrine holds that saints had once all lived. But through their holiness and faith, they earned special merit in God's eyes, which, through canonization, the Church recognizes for popular veneration. So, Essentially, the church does not make you a saint. God has already made you a saint. But through canonization, the church realizes that that person, he or she, has been made a saint by God. And therefore, once the saint is canonized, you could then pray to the saint. Now, before the 12th century, there was no process of canonization. Canonization required to proof that you had uh, done at least three miracles. Uh, you had the advocate for you. You had also had what's called the devil's advocate. That is a lawyer. The church lawyers were called advocates. The devil's advocate was a lawyer for the for Satan, for the devil, to show that the so-called saint did not perform this miracle. Anyway, before the 12th century, 
most saints were simply recognized through popular acclamation. Either in their lifetime or right after the dead, if enough people thought they were saints, they were saints. Mary, the mother of God, the Blessed Virgin, was the most universally venerated saint. But her veneration only began with the efforts of St. Anselm of Canterbury in the early 12th century. Then spread quickly through the West, as seen by the many churches devoted to her. Our Lady of, or in France, Notre Dame, they, which means Our Lady of. When a saint was recognized as a saint, the saint's earthly remains and their personal belongings, clothing, shoes, today, uh, today let's say a toothbrush or something, hairbrush, were all considered relics. And these would be, and oftentimes, this relic was put inside a reliquary, usually gold or silver. So here's the reliquary of St. Martin of Tours. The relic of him is put in here. This is the reliquary of St. Thomas, Thomas the Doubter. This is the reliquary of Charlemagne, who was recognized as a, is recognized as a Catholic saint. Here's a reliquary of John the Baptist. It's supposed to be a piece of John the Baptist's arm. This is a reliquary of the true cross, the true cross being the cross on which Jesus was crucified. Relics heighten the sacrality of those who view and pray before them. So you gain not just remission of your sins, but also greater efficacy in their prayers to the saint. So the saint would normally listen to you, but if you go on a journey, a pilgrimage, to see the a saint's relic or one of the saint's relics and pray before it, it's a better connection to the saint. It's like a direct telephone line directly to the saint, as opposed to one that has to bounce off various towers and maybe not, maybe not, might not be as good. This, by the way, is a reliquary of St. Foy. It is life-size gold and jewels, and this is the relic with this weird crease, which has always creeped me out for some reason. Also, by the way, if you go on the journey, you pray before the relic, some of your saint, some of your sins will be absolved. It's kind of like getting brownie points. So maybe you have less time in purgatory. Besides serving as exemplars of conduct, so saints are, how do I, how should I behave? Look at how St. Foy, look at how Charlemagne, look at how this person behaved. This is their hero. By the 14th century, there was the idea of the patron saint that emerged. So each discipline or profession or act had a patron saint. Example, St. Joseph, who was a carpenter, is a patron saint of carpenters. This is the shrine of St. Bede, who is a patron saint of historians. I went and prayed before his tomb. You might have the patron saint, oh, St. Francis of Rome. <clears throat> St. Francis of Rome, for example, is a patron saint of those who drive cars. St. Isidore of Seville, who wrote a monumental encyclopedia, is a patron saint of the Internet. And there are others as well. There is a patron saint of lawyers. Apparently, there's at least one lawyer recognized as being in heaven. Well, actually, there are two. St. Evo of Chartres is the patron saint of lawyers. Of course, there's also St. Thomas More, but he was a lawyer, but he's recognized as being more of a martyr. Yet another aspect of popular devotion was the pilgrimage. This only becomes common in the 4th century. Early Christians did not do pilgrimages. But pagans... Greco-Roman pagans and Egyptians and others all did. They would go on a pilgrimage to a temple, a shrine, and the gods and heroes of legend like Hercules had relics. 
and you can go and pray before their relic and again get the same benefits. So as the church begins to absorb millions of pagans who really didn't want to be Christians, but were kind of forced into it, the church, to get them to become really good Christians, co-opted many of their popular customs. And again, this will be on my lecture on early Christianity. So one of these popular customs was pilgrimage, also the veneration of relics and saints. Saints is kind of like a hero among the Greeks and Romans. This way it would ease their pilgrimage. One of the most well-known ones today is the pilgrimage to Canterbury, which was part of the background to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. There's another one, the pilgrimage to bury St. Edmund. St. Edmund, the young child, killed early on. Long story. Now, unlike Islam, where pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in your life is required, pilgrimage in Christianity, whether Orthodoxy or Catholicism, is not a requirement, not a religious requirement. Still, it's a popular thing to do, especially in the Middle Ages. Where would pilgrims travel? Well, really big ones are to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nazareth, to Rome. Also, a variety of local shrines. There were tons of shrines for all sorts of different saints. Tours, especially popular. Canterbury, Assisi, to see St. Clair's remain, also St. Francis. Especially to see Santiago de Compostela. Santiago de Compostela is all the way here, so you would travel here all the way out in the middle of uh, Galicia and Spain. And there is the shrine of St. James, the brother of Jesus. Pilgrimages were very popular for remission of sins, especially a mortal sin. So if you had a mortal sin, how do you absolve yourself of it? Well, the priest might send you for your penance on a pilgrimage. Now, it might be a pilgrimage to more than one place, a faraway place, depending on what the sin was. Many people also describe later in my uh, lecture on crime in the Middle Ages, you would, uh, their uh, wrist would be bound with shackles and they'd have a chain between them, a bit long enough so they could eat and stuff. And the idea was they would go on a pilgrimage from one site to another until the chain broke. And when it breaks, that is the sign that God has forgiven you. You're not going to go straight to heaven, but at least you're not going to hell. You're going to purgatory. Now, of course, if you're the cynic today, you would simply say, well, I'm going to get this chain to be, it's just, that's not steel, just iron. Get this chain to be wet all the time, drag it in rain, drag it in rivers, whatever so that it rusts and then just breaks. Assuming, of course, you don't just take a chisel and hammer and break it on your own. But many people refuse to do that. They were very, very, very worried about going to hell. So assuming that they weren't hanged for the mortal sin, like murdering somebody or executed, and they're given this penance, they would actually wrap up the chain in sort of oil skin which is not quite waterproof, but pretty damn close. They try to keep it, they hold it over their heads and try to keep it out of the water as much as possible because finally when it did break on its own, it really was a sign that they were not going to hell. Also remember, if you go on a pilgrimage, God, or certainly the saint, is far more likely to listen to you and grant your prayers. Now, beginning in the 13th century, and especially during the Black Plague, when it seems that God is punishing everyone for their lack of devotion, flagellants became popular. There was no leader. There was no central doctrine. This was a way for thousands to publicly practice the self-mortification that mystics and others did for penance and piety, though it was outside the church's control and this worried the church. Anything outside the church's control worried them because they were always worried about people falling into heresy and then even accidentally winding up in hell. 
And again, more on that in my lecture on heresy and witchcraft. You see it here. These are the different flagellants. They are whipping themselves. Often they will whip themselves bloody. During the Black Death, the movement reached its peak all across all Europe, except England. For some reason, there's no flagellants in England. The most popular group was the Brothers of the Cross, as you see here, also here. The Brothers of the Cross wore white robes. These are, generally speaking, only men. They would march across Germany in 33-day spurts, stopping every day for a ritual reading of a letter supposedly brought to them by an angel, followed by public singing of hymns, while they would scourge themselves, whip themselves, until their blood flowed. Crazy, I know. But as they operated outside again, the purview of the church, you see them here, the flagellants, and this thing, it's hard to say, but this is a long line of the flagellants on their way. And here you see them again, going through a town. In 1349, they were banned. And then finally in 1372, since it still clearly persisted, they were declared heretics and rounded up by the Inquisition. But outbreaks would still occur during times of stress. The plague, whenever it came back, so would the flagellants. There were also times of stress, especially in Italy in 1399, in Germany in 1414, and in France as late as 1480. And then there was mysticism, which, unlike similar movements in Islam and Eastern Orthodoxy, arose fairly late in Western Europe, not really until the 14th century, and then became especially common among women, which I describe more better in my uh, lecture on nuns and uh, sisters and mystical women. So there are some men who followed mysticism, but they don't go to these extremes. But there are pagan mystics. There always had been. There are Buddhist mystics. There are what you call Confucian and Shinto mystics, Hindu mystics. Uh, there are Muslim mystics. There are Eastern Orthodox. They're almost entirely 99% to 100% men. But in Western Europe, really 75% at least, maybe more, who were women. As in other places around the world, through time, mystics used meditation, breathing exercises, and either rhythmic prayer or sound, and a lot of fasting, to put themselves into a trance so as to touch God or the gods, if only momentarily. But in medieval Catholicism, Mystics endeavored less to touch God and more to experience Christ's passion and death, that is, his pain and suffering, to induce a state of ecstasy, religious ecstasy, required to transcend mor uh, mortality. It's kind of it's hard to explain religious ecstasy, but it's reading the descriptions of those the mystics who experienced it, it's kind of like a spiritual orgasm, totally non-sexual. If you're getting any kind of sexual pleasure out of it, that is clearly not ecstasy. And as a result, in art, you start to see the bleeding Jesus appear. And for example, here is one. Before then, the pictures of Christ crucified, there was really no blood. But now you see it's like the blood is just gushing out. His hands, notice the, the wound in his side, his feet, just like rain everywhere. This is when it becomes popular starting in the 14th century. This, of course, is a hair shirt, which is something you would wear along with a belt of thorns. Or Catherine of Siena would wear the, well, the crown of thorns on her head all the time. It's good to suffer, suffer in odd ways. And many of the suffering was, and again, look for my lecture on medieval mystics, what I call spiritual aerobics. Some would call it fairly bizarre behavior. Anyway, finally, the day before Ash Wednesday, before the 40-day fast of Lent began, 
was celebrated as Carnival. Today, you might think of it as Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday, Grove Tuesday. It's a Christianized pagan festival, which involved heavy drinking, lots of eating, especially of the forbidden foods that you're not going to be able to eat during Lent, essentially meat, role reversal. The knights pretend to be peasants, peasants pretend to be lords and knights. Priests pretend to be horrible sinners, sinners pretend to be priests. So role reversals, wearing of costumes that aren't your own, so men can dress as women, women can dress as men. The only time that's allowed, because in the Old Testament, men dressing as women and women dressing as men is a terrible sin, it is a mortal sin. It'll get you sent to hell. Games, joust, stage plays, cockfights, bear baiting, dice games, a lot of filthy songs and filthy dancing, obscene gesturing, even to nuns and priests and monks, and especially mockery of the nobility, the wealthy, and the church. Here's the wrap-up quote. Yes, that is a dog. That is St. Ginnifort, the Holy Greyhound. Here it is. Quote, When preaching against sorcery and hearing confessions, I heard many women confess that they had carried their children to St. Ginnifort. I made inquiries and at last heard that he was a certain greyhound, a dog! A dog innocently killed after saving a child from a snake. The local peasants, hearing of the dog's noble deed and innocent death, began to visit the place and honor the dog as a martyr in quest of help for their sicknesses and other needs. Women, especially with sick or poorly children, carried them to the place and prayed for healing. And often they were healed. This is Father Etienne de Bourbon, 1330. So, let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like share and subscribe, especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos. And make sure to click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.